Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is September 22nd. Today in Botanical History, we'll celebrate the fourth Earl of Chesterfield, an English botanist and a patron saint of gardeners. We'll hear an excerpt from a book by Tom Robbins featuring September in Louisiana. And we grow that garden library today with a book that inspires us to make plants feel right at home in our homes. And then we'll wrap things up with a milestone moment in the history of Australia. It's the stunning loss of the Garden Palace. It happened on this day, 139 years ago today. Well, I have to let you in on a little something that just happened within the past hour. I was working on yesterday's show, and Max, our new dog, is a fetch maniac. He's sitting here right now looking at me like, really, you want to record an episode when we could be playing fetch? Um, but in any case, he he's a talker. And if you have a verbal dog, you know what I'm talking about. But he's attempting to communicate with me verbally all the time. And one of the things I've gotten used to is having tennis balls all over the house. And of course, they roll under chairs and sofas and the like. And then he gets really verbal then. Well, I was editing yesterday's show and he was letting me know that there was a ball that had rolled under the chair that I'm working on. And so I set down my MacBook and I went to look under the chair and he came around behind me. He was so excited. And then he accidentally stepped on my MacBook. And I think what he did is he stepped on the screen. So it bent back a little further than it normally should. And so Bye-bye laptop. That's basically what happened. And I tell you what, you know, in the past, that would have been a deal breaker for me because I record onto that. But now the software has gotten so much better that I'm now recording into a program that is cloud-based. And in fact, almost everything I do now is cloud-based. So I just hopped on over to my backup Mac, my old Mac here, and that's what I'm recording on. So if you notice a slight difference, the technology is a little older, I don't think you're going to notice any difference at all, but that's what just happened to me. And so as I record this show, I'm going to be thinking about my Mac. It it bugs me when something like that isn't right. It's like a sliver or a thorn. You know, when I was picking pumpkins this past weekend. I didn't go out there with any tools. I didn't go out there with any snips. You would have been so disappointed in me. And I tell you what, you're going to get some slivers if you're just working with pumpkin vines. It just happens. Those things are a little prickly. And I'm still taking stickers out of my fingers. But I think the most aggravating part of all of this is just knowing that I have to take it to the Apple store. They're going to ask me if I've got it all backed up. I'm never ever quite sure if it's 100% backed up. So I always worry about losing data. And then probably it means being without my laptop for who knows how long. Ah, Deep breath, right? Well, there's nothing we can do about it now. So we might as well talk gardening. All right, it's time for today's curated news. Today's curated news is one of my favorite things to talk about. It is the 2022 Garden Trends Report. I can't believe I'm saying that. It's from Garden Media Group. They're the group that always does this. 2022, you guys. Amazing. Well, anyway, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what they're talking about here. You can download the report for yourself. I'm going to include a link to it in today's show notes. I'll also put it in the Facebook group for the show. So if you want to check it out for yourself, there. These reports are very in-depth and they're beautiful. These guys are in marketing and they do a wonderful job putting together really, really pretty stuff for garden trends. Okay, let's see how they start out here. I'm going to just get you through this super fast and then you can drill down into all of the information for yourself using the full report that you have access to. 
Okay, so they start out here by saying that we are as individuals trying to redefine who we are and innovate our own lives. Interesting. This great reset is a direct result of the pandemic when many people had to quit their jobs, up in their lives, stay home, take stock of what's important and what they want for the rest of their lives. And so we're in the middle of this great reset. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling that shift as I'm helping my kids transition into college and help plan their own lives. It seems to be something that we're talking about quite a bit. And this, of course, leads into something called the creator class, that people are putting together their own content. And in the world of gardening, that means that you're going to see things that you traditionally see in garden centers. Well, you're going to start seeing that online on various platforms, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. And you may be noticing that more and more. I know I am when I'm going into garden centers lately. They're talking about their Instagram. They're making videos for YouTube and they're trying to get likes on those platforms. So the world of gardening, something very, very grounded, is finding its way online. Crazy, I know, but it is happening. Ooh, and here's an interesting statistic that they share. In six weeks during the pandemic, Zoom, and I'm pretty sure you know what Zoom is, went from 10 million daily participants to over 300 million. That's a profound impact. Lots of us are now online. And we're learning about gardening online as well, not just podcasts. So this is where Garden Trend says, we're going to see a hybrid future. We're gonna be doing some things in person, obviously, because we can't be growing plants completely online. We're gonna to have to still go to garden centers and so on, but we will be doing some things online. Now, I don't wanna scare you, but one of my favorite garden centers up here, Dundee Nursery, I noticed that they closed down their garden center, their little shopping area. They are closing that down for the season. You can continue to still buy plants outside right now until the end of fall. But as of right now, they have closed down their garden center, which was filled with all kinds of wonderful little retail-y things that gardeners love to buy in addition to house plants. And I don't know if they're shifting all of that to online sales now or if they've just decided they're not doing it. But I, for one, will be very sad if our garden centers do not stay open year round or if we make a shift to going entirely online. That would be very sad. Oh, now here's an interesting trend. They're calling this trend front zones. So what they're talking about is if you think about your home, you have various zones around your house that you can garden in. And the very first zone is your front yard. It's the front zone. So this is where you're going to be paying extra attention to things like curb appeal, putting in things like elevated planter boxes and window boxes, areas where you can actually plant and enjoy right in your front zone. And speaking of front zone, here's something that we did to our front zone that has made a big difference in how we like to do things around here. One, we've installed security cameras to make sure our front zone is safe. We've done that in other areas of the house as well, but I'm sure like most of you, security is a concern for all zones. And then the second thing is Wi-Fi because you need Wi-Fi in order to have security or do other things that you want to do outside. I know when I'm outside gardening, I want to be able to listen to podcasts or do things online, whether it's help the kids with something or record something. And so having good Wi-Fi in that front zone or the zones around the house, that's something now that we're thinking about that we used to never even consider. So front zone gardening or the perimeter of the house, there's technology creeping in there as well. Now, the other thing that the Trends Report talks about is indoor zoning. They continue to see that the houseplant category is very strong. People want things from the 70s. They love their spider plants. They love their African violets and ferns, of course, lots of ferns. 
But here's the biggest takeaway, I think, from the trends report. And maybe you're noticing this as well, but this is a staggering statistic. So think about this. They say we gained 18.3 million new gardeners during the pandemic. So I'm just going to round up and say almost 20 million new gardeners during 2020. During that year, we were all shut down, locked down in our homes. People were starting to garden. Now, I think it would be interesting if we could get those people together and see, are they still gardening this year? I don't know what the retention rate is. So that I would be curious to know, but there's no doubt about it. People change their behavior in the Great Reset, and part of that reset was turning to gardening or incorporating gardening activities into their lives, whether it's a countertop garden, a rooftop garden, a little planter on their deck, or just a complete full-blown backyard vegetable nirvana. <laughs> Crazy. All right, and here's another cool statistic, backyard birding. Becoming a birder is one of those activities that kind of overlaps. You can't help but be in your garden and notice the birds and have bird houses and then eventually be interested in taking care of the birds or helping the birds, whether it's with water or food. But catch this, sales of bird feeders and bird feed in general soared, and they are projecting that the sales for 2021 will exceed $2 billion. That is a tremendous increase in this category. Now, here's where the report talks about things like gardening for wildlife, incorporating natives, taking care of big old trees in addition to planting new trees. And they also give this really nice list of trees that you can plant for pollinators. And they include the Eastern Redbud, the Crab Apple, the Southern Magnolia, the Black Gum Tree, and the tulip tree. Now, not all of those are probably going to work in the area where you're at, but I bet one of them, at least one of them, will work in your growing zone. So be sure to check that out. Oh, and then check this out. I love this. It says, flowers are the new hugs. Isn't that the truth? When we couldn't get together with our loved ones, I don't know about you, but I was sending flowers. And so flowers here are being called the new hugs. And then it says, giving or receiving flowers triggers feel-good hormones, so they have healing powers. That's great. Now, I'm just going to flip through the rest of this here really quickly, but I see that the hue that is catching their eye the most is the color of clover, so green. They're saying green is a color of renewal, and after living in a world that has slowed down where we've got stoppages and shortages and backups, people are looking for renewal, rebirth, and greater stability. And so green is that color. And so that's the prediction that that color will be really hot moving forward. Okay, well, that I think really sums up a lot. There's even more in this report, but I find it fascinating. And if you want to check it out for yourself, see what analogies you can draw to your own life, what insights you may have about this report and how it relates to you and your garden world, or even in other aspects of your life, whether you have a job or you have another hobby, some of these insights may actually pertain to those areas of your life as well. All right, so as I mentioned before, I will put a link to the 2022 Garden Trends Report from Garden Media Group. I will put it in the Facebook group for the show. When you go there, you should see it there right at the top. It'll be one of the top posts. If you don't see it, just head on up to the little magnifying glass. You'll see it at the top of the page there and you can just type in trend. This report will pop up. If you're not in the group, you have a standing invitation. You can join it anytime. All you need to do is head on up to the search bar in Facebook where you'd search for an old friend and then type in the words Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'll see you in there. All right, it's time for today's botanical history. Mm -hmm. 
Here's Botanical History for today, September 22nd. Today is the birthday of Philip Dormer Stanhope. He was the fourth Earl of Chesterfield, an English statesman and writer, and he was born on this day, September 22nd in 1694. Philip is remembered for his letters he wrote to his son and to other notable people of his day. I love this. He once advised his son, I recommend you to take care of the minutes, for the hours will take care of themselves. Attention to detail. Yale University, incidentally, has a note that Chesterfield wrote. It contained the words to a little verse. It's called, On a Lady Stung by a Bee. I'd never seen it before, and I thought it was very charming. I'll read it to you now. To heal a wound a bee had made upon my Chloe's face, its honey to the part she laid, and bade me kiss the place. Pleased, I obeyed, and from the wound sucked both the sweet and smart. The honey on my lips I found, the sting within my heart. And today is the birthday of George Bentham, the English botanist, writer, and teacher. He was born on this day in 1800. George was going to be an attorney, but he decided to pursue botany after he had a chance to live in the country. His thinking was preserved in a diary, which he kept for over 50 years. George once wrote, I decided that my means were sufficient to enable me to devote myself to botany, a determination which I have never had any reason to regret. George's longest professional friendship was with the botanist John Stuart Mills, who had lived with the Bentham family as a teenager. A pragmatist, George finished his Flora of the British Islands by writing every morning before breakfast, and he purposefully used simple language so that his book could reach a wider audience. George wanted everyone to see fundamental differences in plants, and the useful way that he classified plants laid the foundation for modern taxonomy. Later in his career, George co-authored the three-volume Genera Plantarum with Sir Joseph Hooker. The Bentham and Hooker system, as it was called, was widely used and made plant classification easier. George also worked with Ferdinand Mueller to create an impressive 19-volume Flora of Australia. Now, here's something you'll like. In 1830, George discovered opal basil, that's the purple basil, which is prized for its flavor and color. But the plant that George is most associated with is an Australian plant. It's a sister plant to tobacco, and it's Nicotiana benthemiana, and it's named in George's honor. And in a fascinating twist, this particular plant is used to create vaccines for the Ebola virus and the coronavirus. Good old George Bentham died just two weeks shy of his 84th birthday. And today, September 22nd, is the feast day of Focus the Gardener, a Turkish innkeeper and gardener who lived during the third century. A protector of persecuted Christians, Focus grew crops in his garden to help feed the poor. His garden aided him in living out his most remembered virtues, hospitality and generosity. One day, when Roman soldiers arrived in his village, Focus offered them lodging and a homemade meal using the bounty of his garden. As they talked, Focus realized they had come for him. So, while the soldiers slept, Focus went out to the garden to dig his own grave and pray for the soldiers. In the morning, 
focus revealed his identity, and the soldiers reluctantly killed him. Although gardening can be a solitary activity, focus illustrated how gardens create connection and community. Today, focus is the patron saint of flower and ornamental gardens, farmers, field hands, and market gardeners. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words are from a book by Tom Robbins. It's called Jitterbug Perfume, one of my favorite titles. Here's an excerpt. Louisiana in September was like an obscene phone call from nature. The air, moist, sultry, secretive, and far from fresh, felt as if it were being exhaled into one's face. Sometimes it even sounded like heavy breathing. Honeysuckle, swamp flowers, magnolia, and the mystery smell of the river scented the atmosphere, amplifying the intrusion of organic sleaze. It was aphrodisiac and repressive, soft and violent at the same time. In New Orleans, in the French Quarter, miles from the barking lungs of alligators, the air maintained this quality of breath, although here it acquired a tinge of metallic halitosis due to the fumes expelled by tourist buses, trucks delivering Dixie beer, and on Decatur Street, a mass transit motor coach named Desire. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Wild Interiors by Hilton Carter. This book came out in 2020, and the subtitle is Beautiful Plants in Beautiful Spaces. Amen to that. And I should say that this book has one of my favorite covers ever. So hats off to the book designer who came up with that incredible cover. Now, Carter Hilton is a plant stylist, he's a plant whisperer and a plant coach, and all of that comes into play in this inspiring book of home interiors that are full of life, style, balance, health, and of course, plants. Hilton is a master of greenery, and his approach to creating a welcoming room is to make your plants feel right at home. So make the plants happy, make your guests feel welcomed. And what I love about this book in particular is that Hilton uses these pages to take us on a tour of a dozen different homes that feature their own unique ways of incorporating plants into their interiors and their design. Each space is thoughtfully laid out, well curated, super comfortable, and beautiful. And if you're a plant lover, you're going to page through this time and time again. This book is 224 pages of plants at home in the home. And what a welcome addition for each of us to make for our plants. Lots of plant styling inspiration in this book. You can get a copy of Wild Interiors by Hilton Carter and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $17. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Well, today, it's probably more apt to say it's a heartbreaking botanic spark because today's botanic spark is about the iconic Garden Palace in the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney. It was on this day, September 22nd in 1882, 
at 5.40 a.m. that the beautiful Garden Palace was completely destroyed in a fire. It consumed the entire 14-hectare structure in just 40 minutes. The flames could be seen for 20 miles. This building was modeled after the Crystal Palace, but it was constructed primarily with timber. Now, the Garden Palace had been built at a record pace. It was completed in just over eight months for the Sydney International Exhibition in 1879. This incredibly huge building dominated Sydney's skyline for only three years. In its glory, there was a statue of the Queen that stood beneath the palace dome, which was made of 36 stained glass windows. After the exhibition closed, the reason it was built, the Garden Palace was unfortunately used to store important records, including the 1881 census, which is a dagger in the heart to all genealogists, and of course, countless irreplaceable indigenous artifacts, which is an absolute tragedy and terribly heartbreaking. Now, the cause of the fire has never been established, and we will probably never know exactly what happened. But at the time of the fire, there was a French artist named Lucien Henri who captured what he saw on canvas. And his assistant, George Hippolyta Arusso, recalled that moment in a 1912 edition of the Technical Gazette. He said, Mr. Henri went out onto the balcony and watched until the great dome toppled in. It was then early morning. He went back to his studio, procured a canvas, sat down, and painted the whole scene in a most realistic manner, showing the fig trees in the domain, the flames rising through the towers, the dome falling in, and the reflected light of the flames all around. Such a loss. Today, the Pioneer Memorial Garden rests on the site where the dome would have been. This garden was built in 1938, and it commemorated the 150th anniversary of European settlement in Australia. Of course, now I think if they had the chance to do it over, they should have commemorated something else. They should have commemorated the unbearable loss, the priceless and precious loss of all of that indigenous history, the artifacts, the relics, the thousands of items that were lost to time on that day. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove and Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.